1 Kings 18, verses 20 through 39, starting at verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah then came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets number 450. Let two bowls be given to us. Let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire is indeed God. All the people answered, well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bowl and prepare it first, for you are many. Then call on the name of, of your God and put no fire on it. Then they took the bull that was given them, prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no answer. They had limped about the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he has wandered away, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. Then they cried aloud and As was their custom, they cut themselves with swords and and lances until the blood gushed out over them. As midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no answer, no response. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come closer to me, and all the people came closer to him. First he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar large enough to, to contain two measures of seed. Next he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, laid it on the wood and said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So that the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. Normally, Yahweh worship was not as exciting as Baal worship. Everybody wanted to be a Baal prophet. Uh, Baal was attractive. Baal made uh, lavish promises. Baal was fun and Baal was flashy. The Baals and his prophets would tell you anything you wanted or needed to hear as, as long as it kept you coming back. Baal made money. Baal hired many slick prophets. The prophets of Baal were like the stereotyped car salesman saying to you whatever is necessary to make the sale. But bring the car back a couple weeks later in need of repairs and the salesman's no place to be found. In in comparison, Yahweh was kind of boring. He just said things like, don't steal from your friends. Uh, Don't lie. Honor your parents. Don't follow after phony gods who don't deliver. Just straightforward. Yahweh wasn't glitzy. Yahweh doesn't sell very well. I don't know if you've noticed. I think Elijah got excited about this moment, this one opportunity to like do something grand. I think he was like so thrilled. He finally gets to make a spectacle. The result of the event 
wouldn't turn out great for Elijah when Queen Jezebel finally gets word of it. She puts a contract out on his life, and he has to run to get out of town. He runs all the way from Samaria, which is, which is in the northern part of Israel, all the way down to Sinai. He runs away, and he's, he's there moping. So it wouldn't turn out really well for him. He poked the beast. He said, hey, this whole religious system is fake. And Elijah ended up with a price on his head. In some ways, maybe he underestimated the uh, power of the religious system. Don't go poking the beast unless you're willing to pay the price. So let's think about this for just a minute. So what makes a false god false? Now, a lot of times people just say what mostly comes into their heads which is, well, a false god is false because that false god doesn't really exist. But also maybe it's more than that. What we see here is the false god is false because the false god doesn't deliver. So you see, this is what Elijah was trying to say. You've been spending all your time trying to work up to Get this false God to give you what you want or need, but he won't do it. That was the message. And that's why it's so harmful. What makes false gods dangerous is that they lead us down a road and then off a cliff, thinking we're going to find what we're looking for. We end up, to quote another unpopular prophet Jeremiah, we end up drinking from cisterns that have no water. Thinking there's going to be water, we slurp dust. Baal was the the god of the harvest and fertility. If you paid your money, if you did your service, if you supported the system, if you made the proper sacrifices, Baal would reward you with good crops. That's what it was all about. That was the promise. And with that, the people could be controlled because they could be made these promises. If you don't do that, you know, things aren't going to go very well with you. You you better do that. And Elijah comes along and says, you know, all that service, all that devotion, all that cutting, all that stuff you're doing, your crops aren't any better as a result of that magic and superstition and manipulation. That's what he's trying to prove. He's trying to get the people to recognize that this isn't working. Which is probably why three years earlier, Elijah had prayed for a drought. Because it was the beginning of trying to challenge Baal's promises. So there's this drought for three years simply to try to show that all of their incantations and all of their devotion and all of their efforts to please the deity don't work. Baal doesn't deliver. But Elijah's message is more than that. In verse 1, Elijah asks the question to the people, how long will you go limping between two opinions? He doesn't just say, how long will you go limping between two different names for God? How long will you go limping between two approaches to God? Two opinions. The problem in Israel at this time is that they were trying to meld the worship of Baal and the worship of Yahweh. They were trying to figure out a way to fit fit them together. And as a result, they couldn't walk straight. They were limping along. One commentator interpreted this as a euphemism for walking in circles. They were walking with a limp. And so all they could do was go in circles. Baal worship and Yahweh worship were not blendable. And the reason why we're so susceptible to Baal worship, the reason we are so susceptible to Baal messages, is because life is so uncertain. And the future is so unknown. Like having a successful crop, for example. So many things can go wrong. The reality of uncertainty makes us easy prey for false promises and 
phony superstitious magic and guarantees. Baal worship operated very, very similarly to our advertising world. It doesn't matter if it's true. As long as it makes the sale and people think it might be true, they'll buy it. We are easy marks for these promises. If you want to be successful, you need to drive our car or brush your teeth with our toothpaste or drink our beer. I love that one. We're told that by and we're told that by a lot of nice looking people. You'll be around these these really cool looking people who are laughing all the time. Like it's a perpetual party. If you just use our product. We're convinced that beautiful cool people will want to have a great time with us if we drink coke. Or if we drink it the world will find peace and all sing in harmony. And we want peace and harmony, so we fall for it. But then what? Maybe we find out, hopefully we discover that Duracell batteries don't make your flashlight last longer. Eclipse gum doesn't kill germs. Vitamin water does not boost your immune system and keep you healthy. Kashi all-natural Goline products are mostly made of synthetic ingredients. Active yogurt does not regulate your digestive system. All those products have paid out class action settlements. They don't care. They've already made their money. And we go limping on to the next big idea, <laughs> to the next product or the next promise of success or power or riches or well-being or heaven. That's why the nations throughout history, if you look at it, nations throughout history are so, get so often connected with religion. There's no better or more powerful tool from which to manipulate and control the minds and lives of others than these false promises. This transactional view of God. Queen Jezebel, who married King, was married to King Ahab at this time of Elijah that we're talking about, brought the worship of Baal with her from her home country of Phoenicia, where modern Lebanon is now. Jezebel would be familiar with the way religion worked for most of these larger uh, cultures. And she saw that Baal worship, or this kind of worship, the Baals, could keep people in line and controlled. You promise rewards for worship and money, or threats of punishment if you don't obey. Your crops will fail if you don't do this or don't do that, right? So Elijah gets this, the chance to expose all the promises of Baal worship as false. Now here's the thing that we can easily miss. What Elijah is exposing isn't the wrong name for God. What he is exposing is the, is the way they were viewing how God works. It wasn't just turn from Baal and turn to Yahweh. It was turn to Yahweh and away from that way of using religious devotion. Quit turning God's ways into a transaction. Quit making a deal with God. <laughs> it's not the way Yahweh works. That's why he doesn't mark it very well. When we view our worship and devotion as a way to get God to pay us, then no matter what we call God, we are worshiping Baal. It's a struggle. Because life is so uncertain, we are drawn to make things go our way by paying the gods. We have our gods, right? We've got our gods of beauty and intelligence and power and riches. We have our gods undermining our culture in our day as badly as Baal undermined Israel's culture in their day. So the message of Yahweh was different than this message of transaction. The message of Yahweh was Yahweh provides all we need for free right now without limitation. 
Yahweh has already blessed you with all the love you need, compassion you need, forgiveness you need, everything you need to live a full, abundant, free, wonderful life has already been given to you. Worship and devotion is gratitude for a gift already given, not the religious act to get God to give it. Following after other gods was condemned, not because Yahweh wants all the attention on himself, but because false religion is ruining the lives of his children. He doesn't want us fooled or manipulated or coerced or enslaved. He doesn't want us susceptible to those who would use us for their own gain. Elijah was breaking the spell. He was saying, take He wasn't saying, take what you are doing for Baal and do that for Yahweh. Yahweh wants no part of a system of power, control, and manipulation and coercion. And anyone who turns Yahweh into that kind of a system is promoting Baal worship, not Yahweh worship. Years ago, I was in Israel, and we went to this ancient city of Dan and saw one of the altars to Baal. And we were talking about it, and the teacher was teaching about it. And what was so interesting, the teacher said, was that it looked just like the altars of Yahweh. The interesting thing is the word for Baal and the word for Yahweh, same word. Baal is a Ugaritic word. Yahweh is a Hebrew word. They mean Lord. So Elijah wasn't just trying to substitute names. He was saying, Yahweh, Yahweh worship is entirely different than Baal worship. The difference was not how the altars looked, but in how the altar was used. Not the names, and we can be easily fooled. This table that we're going to participate in here in just a few minutes Yahweh worship says this is a symbol of what God has already done for all humanity in Jesus. That's Yahweh's table. We announce God's welcome to his table, invite all to come and eat from this table of love and grace and forgiveness. It's all here. God doesn't take any of it back. It's all free. It's all for you. It's all been done. That's Yahweh's table. But it can also be presented as a bail table, as a reward meal for those who have met the requirements, perform their religious duties, pass their religious requirements, then the table becomes the table of bail, a payment for devotion. As Yahweh's table, table of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the table of Jesus, we proclaim to the world, here is the way things are. Here is what is true. Here is what you can count on. Here is what you can receive, that you are welcomed, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are home. The table represents an end to all religious or social or political manipulative techniques. Here is the end. This table represents an end to using religion for power and control. The end of using religion to get people to shape up and do what you want them to do. It's not what this table's about. Here is true freedom to be your true self, to respond with gratitude for a love that is eternal, unconditional, and already given. Let's worship Yahweh in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.